Please welcome our next panel. Ellen Nakashima, national security reporter at the Washington Post. With our panelists, Tobias Fikin, founder of Protostar Strategy, Jorge Guajardo, partner at the DGA Group and co-chair of the Aspen Institute's Global Cybersecurity Group, Jarrett C. Riddick, senior fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University, and Jessica chun Bice, David M. Lampton Professor of China Studies at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Please welcome the panel. Well, thank you, and welcome, everyone. Um, we, we had a, uh, the, the title of our panel was Myth Busting, What Do We Get Wrong About China? It's a nice sort of provocative title, and, uh, and it got me thinking, though, with, with that question, it sort of presupposes you, you want to know, you want to devise a pretty good, effective strategy or policy for um, dealing with, with China. And as part of that, want to know what are the real outcomes? What is it that we actually want to achieve vis-a-vis -vis China? And so our panel today is going to discuss, uh, I think, what the, the goals are in our competition with China, what the strategies are to achieve that, whether they're working or not, what do we get right and what do we get wrong as we try to, as the US and its allies and partners try to work towards that goal. So I'm going to start with uh, Jessica Chen Weiss from uh, Johns Hopkins University and talk about, ask you to start with, you know, Vice President Harris has said that the goal with China is to win the competition for the 21st century, in part by winning it through emerging technologies like quantum and AI, and by focusing on American technology Jessica, is, is that the right goal? Is it to win the competition or is it to manage it? And is the strategy to achieve it working? What do we get right? What do we get wrong in that? Well, first, thanks so much. It's great to be here with all of these illustrious speakers. I guess, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, China's activities, whether it's espionage or hacking, efforts to embed vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure do pose a major challenge, and American policymakers are rightly focused on that. That said, I think in, whether in Beijing or in Washington, rhetoric about winning the future or winning the 21st century you know, sets up a reflexively zero-sum frame that makes it difficult uh, to maintain the kinds of integration um, that both societies uh, benefit from. And, and whereas you know, yesterday, um, ordinary activities between companies, researchers, and students uh, were seemed valuable, now they uh, are pulling back from those activities for fear uh, of being deemed disloyal. And the problem here is that integration, to some degree, even though it, as we need to you know, mitigate the risks, we also need to recognize that there are, are real benefits to American interests of remaining to some degree connected, if only to learn uh, you know, what Chinese scientists and innovators are working on uh, in China. In some areas, whether it's in renewable energy or others, Chinese uh, you know, producers are well in front. And so the idea that we could uh, simply win um, by walling ourselves off and walling them out, I think, is a misplaced. Can I just push back on you for a minute there? Because I think what the administration has said is that it's not seeking to completely you know, cut off China or, or decouple entirely. It wants to focus in on a, a number of, of you know, discrete uh, emerging technologies that are crucial to what they say is China's uh, military modernization, uh, maybe wep building weapons of mass destruction, and they have this concept of the small yard high fence to just home in on a handful of these emerging technologies and then build up strong defenses there, export controls or what have you. So with that in mind, do you think that strategy is, is smart and effective? So I think that the Biden administration has gotten a number of things right, including kind of invoking a shared purpose, you know, defending an order where might doesn't equal right, and arguing that you know, a complete decoupling is unrealistic and that de-risking um, is a better way of going about it. That said, I think that the, you know, the process of determining where to remain connected and where to uh, you know, pursue some degree of separation is in incredibly complex, and I'm a little concerned that the process underway to evaluate these trade-offs doesn't necessarily take enough stock of uh, the risks and costs to American 
uh, and the ability of American firms and other uh, leading firms in developed democracies uh, to continue to um, progress, uh, as well as potentially um, the fact that by imposing these kinds of uh, restrictions and export controls, they may actually be having the counterproductive effect of kind of forcing Chinese companies, private and otherwise, to work with the government and other domestic suppliers, um, maybe even creating the very juggernaut that these restrictions are, were intended uh, to stymie. Great. I, I think, Toby, you've had some uh, experience in this area as former cyber ambassador to Aust from Australia. What's your perspective on this strategy? Firstly, great to be back in DC. This is the first time I've been back since I finished up in my role, so it's really nice to see so many friendly faces. Um, indeed, the six years that I spent in that role, um, I would say I was in the hot seat for the Australian approach, which was very much a security first approach in terms of understanding threats, risks, and vulnerabilities. And one of the distinct features to contextualize what's going on right now is that you know, it's the tech convergence of key technologies and the way that they interplay, they reinforce each other's innovation cycles. And you've mentioned a few of those, whether they be quantum, AI, biotechnology. Those technologies basically will shape the power structures of the 21st century. And we're only beginning to vaguely understand where that takes us. Genuinely, the innovators who are developing these technologies are still quite unsure of where that journey takes us. But what we're sure of is that if you are in, if you like, first place, in the emergence of those technologies and the ownership of key areas of those technologies, then you are at the forefront of global power structures. So in sense of winning outright, that's a difficult objective, but keeping competitive advantage mm. is absolutely the key aim here. And then when you look at key policies that especially the US has taken around semiconductors, which are essentially you know, one of the key underpinning technologies of, of all of those other frontier technologies that I mentioned. You know, I, I think the US has done a quite incredible job. I'll go as far as saying that's one of the most impactful, the CHIPS Act and associated trade restrictions has been one of the most impactful um, supply chain policies that we've seen at least in the last 40 years. And it's created, if you like, a maybe five year air gap where the US can now innovate in that space. And I think one of the risks though, is that it's not now time for pats on the backs and job well done. It's now time to push home that innovation advantage and make sure that you utilize the money spent and the efforts to comprehensively shift a key supply chain within two years. I mean, it's quite remarkable when you look at the shifts that have gone on in that time. Mm -hmm. Jared, you so I think part of uh, the, 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 the basis of the question that you're answering mm -hmm. and, and what, what uh, Tobias has talked about um, is, is a talent question as well. Because if we're saying that we will uh, turn inward and use our own resources to engage in this competition, then talent becomes very important. And you know, we look, um, we just did some work at CSET to look at the, the CSET global- CSET is the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. Right? Yes, thank you. So mm -hmm. public service announcement. CSET, Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. We are a no kidding DC think tank work in the area of AI and national security to produce um, uh, evidence-based uh, recommendations for policymakers. And we've just done a study to look at the global producers of STEM talent, and clearly there's a tremendous gap between China and the United States. And so when we look at that, you know, we will have to have robust um, immigration policy and remain sort of open to the world in terms of, of gaining talent. But domestic talent and sort of the stores of talent that we have in sort of groups that have not been represented as stewards of technology is a real growth opportunity for the United States. But as Tobias said, with this gap that we have, we have to double down on uh, and adjusting our systems so that they are able to gain um, access to this talent um, in ways that we haven't before. That who's able to gain access? The, the United, United, States, United States internally, domestic talent here in the United States. So in the vein of what are we getting wrong about China, what is it that I think in our, our earlier conversations you were saying yeah. that the U.S. might be uh, unfairly demonizing uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese academics? Yeah. Or, so uh, we, we, when we talked, we talked about this mm -hmm. term China hawks, right? And so there's a, a, a new report out from CSET. Um, Sam Bresnik at CSET, who is a researcher there, has uh, recently written an op-ed in Foreign Policy where he's talking about the impressions of the Chinese military around artificial intelligence. 
and, and you know, statements have been made, you know, China's eating our lunch on AI, um, <coughs> we're way behind, but there's some interesting findings um, from Sam Bresnik in, in this recent um, um, re report that he's done. And one being that the Chinese military in the, the, the public documents that we can see are very concerned with trustworthy AI. And in fact, saying that if, if um, they go forward with AI that's not trustworthy, it could cause um, problems in you know, military applications, escalations. leading to escalations, leading to um, unnecessary casualties in military. And we also know that uh, the Chinese government has said that AI will have to adhere to socialist principles. And so those restrictions from, from that type of statement, but also this notion that there is a, a chief concern among AI um, military um, uh, actors within China around trustworthiness, I think is something that people may miss because we're, we're depicting China as if they will take AI and just unleash it. Hmm. But we see from these military actors that they are concerned with the trustworthiness. So you think of we're AI. maybe overestimating China's prowess and uh, sophistication and rate of innovation in AI? I think we would be, uh, w there is no, we would, we are not overestimating. And I think we would be, um, we would do ourselves a disservice to not take them seriously in the capability, but also the scale, because having volumes and volumes of, of folks working on these problems, you know, puts you sort of at a, at a certain type of disadvantage. But the advantage that we do have is that we have significant qu a quality advantage um, in the talent, and so we have to sort of double down on that and grow domestic talent and maintain the quality advantage that we have in order to keep pace. Okay. Uh, I wanted to get back to uh, some of the, the chip strategy and working with allies and partners, which is a signal feature of the Biden administration's approach to China, right? It's not just U.S. putting up uh, tariffs or export controls against China. It's trying to build coalitions of like-minded partners. Um, and Jorge, Ambassador Guajardo, you've had you know, you've worked on this issue, and, and also not just with you know, the EU or Five Eyes, but global south countries, right, other countries in the world. How do you think the U.S. is doing in that strategy of building um, partnerships with other countries to kind of help in the competition or counter China? So let me answer that question and just very mm -hmm. briefly go back to the previous debate on what I think mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. is getting wrong uh, with regards to China. And I think one of the things I see right now, so I spent six years in Beijing. Uh, as a Mexico's ambassador to China. And I, I noticed the Chinese political system is opaque by design. It's meant to be opaque. It's, it's not meant to be an open system. And something that I see a lot of in the United States these days is certainty among the opinion leaders when it comes to China. You go to politics and prose here in Washington, D.C., and you count the books on the new Cold War, on China, and it's, they, they speak with a certainty. At a time when there are the fewest journalists in China, and these are mostly opinion leaders projecting their values on China and assuming that China will be acting how they would act if they were in their position, and I think that is a, a fraud proposition. So, so I think the certainty with which the U.S. acts is something that in and of itself is something the U.S. might be getting wrong. I think uh, the first thing to realize is that we don't know what's happening there. We really don't know. Uh, now, going back to that certainty, we saw it a lot with the Huawei rollout. Uh, and the United States was going all over the world saying, do not buy Huawei kit because the, the Chinese can spy on you and they would go all over the Global South, uh, Latin America, Africa and other places and say, uh, the Chinese will spy on you uh, if you use Huawei. Well, first of all, keep in mind that as a region or as a Global South, as a, we are not geopolitical players in the sense that we worry as much about being spied on here, first uh, distinction. Second, the US spies on us just as much. Uh, so, so it's not a concern about uh, the Chinese spying on us versus the U.S. Uh, spying on us. Usually the U.S. uses the spying to, to build criminal cases against uh, political leaders, so they might not be as inclined to be favoring with the United States in terms of spying, whereas the Chinese do it for industrial, commercial uh, purposes. Again, we do not have as much intellectual property as you find in developed countries. 
So that idea that you would go around, that the United States would go around talking to uh, developing countries' leaders and warning us about the threat about China spying on us doesn't play as much yeah. as one assumes it does. We, it doesn't scare us as much as people in Washington think. Uh, there, there's an aspect that the United States, again, in its certainty and lack of understanding on how these countries think, oversees. And that is, one, as I mentioned, that we don't worry about as much about being spied upon, but two, that perhaps what would get our attention more is the threat of commercial coercion. And what do I mean by, mean by commercial coercion? If a country has Chinese kit, whether it be Huawei, CT, whatever may come next, in its infrastructure and is dependent on it, they may be susceptible to commercial coercion by China. Now, a country like Mexico, Colombia, Peru, or anyone in Latin America would say, well, we, don't, we are not geopolitical players, we are not afraid about commercial coercion, until you size a Chinese mine, or you arrest a Chinese a fentanyl dealer, somebody with whom the Chinese government takes objection, and then you subject yourself to threats, and might they not probably upgrade your system as fast as you would expect because you're being subjected? Right. So now it's a matter of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now, developing countries understand sovereignty. We don't understand spying, we understand sovereignty. So again, that's a change of emphasis how the United States approaches this issue instead of talking, telling us or warning us about the threat of spying. Tony, Maybe what do you think of, of that, given Australia's position too, and having also been subjected to Chinese economic coercion, but also having to work with uh, non-aligned partners in, in the region to counter China? What's your take? It's, it's quite hard to unsee what you've seen from inside the beast. And so, you know, my, my mind's pretty clear as to, you know, how China is operating, certainly in Australia, how it's operating in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and there may be elements of what Jorge said, which I'm not quite in agreement with. The, the single most poignant thing that Jorge said is this is an issue of sovereignty. And that really should hammer home. And a lot of my time was spent talking to countries around the region, especially where they are caught in this vice-like game of making choices. Um, and in amongst countries that don't want to have to pick sides, they want to get on with building their economy and digitizing and innovating. Um, and that is one of the most powerful messages you can give them. Okay, they may not really care about their networks being owned. They might not have the awareness to understand that. But that's why it's important that you assist countries with building that capability to be able to understand for themselves what's going on on their networks. But there's also another part of this that we had to speak to and engage with countries on, which is the whole indebtedness in the development cycle. Because a big part of the play that China made in our region was around the digital Silk Road and the huge um, infrastructure developments of digital systems and networks that were then, you know, Ladening countries with debt in an incomprehensible way, and, and even worse, you know, than, than having that capability, was not providing the ability to sustain that. I mean, I'm, I'm separating myself completely from you know my, my maybe my ideological leanings here, but you know, to provide the technology, indebt a country to it, and then not even be able to maintain it, and that means all the country has is infrastructure which can be essentially accessed at will by a state that is really just interested in understanding everything about the way you operate as individuals, as a state, as you know, your industry to influence the way that they will then make decisions about what they decide to do with you. Um, that's Chinese decisions. And by the way, also having lived in a country which has been subjected to Chinese coercion very directly, um, once there's a decision made that you are you know, not flavor of the month, sorry to put it in a very you know, glib way, they will then switch off the tap very, very quickly. And you've seen that happen in other parts of the globe. And that's certainly something that Australia had once it had been through this process, as I said, of a security first policy where it was understanding where our risks were. Um, so helping other countries understand more our decision making process and why we arrived at that decision to us was the best way of explaining to other countries why it was important that some of those considerations within, were in their own choices. So it wasn't a matter of saying, you must choose this supplier, but it's saying, here's our example, here's the process we went through, here's how we reached our decision, 
does that make sense to you in the process that you're going through? And actually, we did find a lot of countries sat up and said, yeah, actually, my goodness, yeah, we're going to go through that ourselves. Yeah. I think this administration, too, is trying now, and including with partners in the Asia Pacific, to try to uh, find ways to help other countries resist such economic coercion, build resilience. Does, um, do you have any thoughts on whether or not this strategy seems to have traction, be working? Um, Jared? Before I go to that, I really yeah. would like to stay on the Global South issue okay. as well, because I, as I mentioned, um, the work we did at CSET to look at the uh, global um, producers of STEM talent, um, this was data that had not been updated since 2016. And when we look at, took a look at the most recent data, which was, I think, 2020 data, um, Brazil and Mexico are in the top 10 world producers of STEM talent, which when I saw that, Surprised me. I don't mean that, you know, and to you know, to disparage the the our, our Latin American neighbors. Um, but I think people will be surprised to hear that fact. And so when you think about the encroachment of China into the into Latin America, South America, to the global South, and then I often tell people because of my past uh, in science and technology that I really live in 2035, right? And when you think about 2035 out to 2050, one in four people in the world will be on the continent of Africa. So global South. We say that now sort of as, you know, as we, but in the future that will mean something very different. And the way that the Chinese are positioning now and what that will mean in the future is, again, I think we could put under the category of things that we, that we get wrong because I've talked to many people who say, well, our longstanding relationships hmm. with these countries will give us an advantage no matter what happens. And, and Tobias is very clear in saying that these, the way that the Chinese are doing this is really strapping countries with debt. But I do think that what is happening now and the way it will position the Chinese for a future that will look very different if you're talking about now countries in Brazil and Mexico that are producing great, greater STEM talent, this population explosion that will happen on the continent of Africa, it begins to me to begin another conversation about talent and talent that's being produced in these places that is much different from what has been there in the past. And so that future, really, Tobias said it will. The countries that lead in emerging technologies will be the countries that really have a great advantage going forward. And so the talent mix that exists now in the global south and with, with China being there, I think gives a particular type of advantage that we're not paying attention to if we get into 2050 and they're there and we're not, the talent explodes and then we don't, really don't have an entree into that talent. So I think that is something that's probably not on the radar of most people. And when I talk about it, I think people say to me, well, I haven't heard that before. But I think it's thinking about 2035, 2050, what the population mix is, the STEM talent that's there, and the positioning of China, I think is something that we, we're, in my opinion, sort of missing the ball on. Thank you. Go ahead. I think, Ellen, to your question, I think um, whether it's uh, from Beijing or from Washington, lectures don't uh, win many friends. Um, and so I think the real question is, um, you know, China's co sort of coercion in some ways hasn't been particularly effective on its own kind of steam. Um, separate from the United States coming in and, mm. and trying to, to bolster um, resilience to that uh, coercion. Um, and then, so, I mean, I think that the question for both countries uh, really is what can they offer to the world, right, in the form of, of deliverables or benefits, um, whether that's talking about kind of an effective international order that is functioning where, you know, various countries uh, from the global south have greater voice, um, feel that there's a path to uh, greater prosperity and security. Um, and I worry that there's a little bit of tension um, in some of the uh, rising protectionism um, mm. that uh, what's on offer here um, may be running into, into some of those concerns. Well, let's go there. Let's move a, a little bit to economic strategy because uh, it is clear, right? I mean, to be clear, the U.S. is not decoupling from China. China is still the second largest trading partner to the U.S. And the U.S. is seeking to de-risk its supply chain. And given its experience in the pandemic, it, it, it's, it seems like a prudent idea uh, to diversify the supply chain to include you know, partners and, and, and allies. Um, but at the same time, you do hear uh, you know, DOD has buy American strategies. Both, both uh, parties are focusing on, on you know, investing in America, American jobs. You hear talk about tariffs. Trump is promising 100% you know, tariffs, 60% tariffs. 
How do those two um, competing tensions work together to both position US, the US and its allies to compete better with China and also be more resilient at home? What are we getting right? What are we getting wrong here? I, I would start with industrial policy. Industrial policy is a new word, a new concept we're dealing with in the West that started uh, with China and now we realize that unless we have an aggressive industrial policy, we will not compete with China in certain sectors ever. Uh, sorry, I, I, I see you. Uh, so so, so I, I think the first acknowledgement is to understand that they have made huge inroads in innovation and that is something uh, that you oftentimes see people not understand in the United States because they don't see it. So you have Chinese EVs, electric vehicles, that you can't buy in the United States. They're far superior than anything you can have in the United okay. States. It's the first time in my life that I remember, other than Iranian caviar or Cuban cigars, that the US customer cannot have access to the best product out there. And the best product out there right now are Chinese EVs. Which are so heavily subsidized, right? By the th besides yeah. the point. Yeah. So you yeah. ask people, you tell people here and say, yeah, because they're cheap. Mm. And, and, and you know, because they're good. And you, I mean, there was a, a, a long interview with Jim Farley of Ford uh, last weekend on the Wall Street Journal. He just came back from China and said, wow, I realized how good the Chinese EVs are. So that's all because of industrial policy, yes, subsidies. And that's something the United States has got to consider whether they want to play that game or not. And if yeah. not, to assume that someone else will take the lead. So, so I really want to come in here because it sounds exactly what you described there. It feels to me like I'm on repeat rewind with 5G because there is no getting away from the fact that, you know, despite security misgivings around 5G telecommunications equipment built by Huawei or ZTE, um, the innovation that had taken them to world-leading 5G technology was frustrating at the time as a, a Western diplomat when you're trying to sell your alternative proposition and it, it's at a price point which is well below Western competitors. You know, that, that is a very difficult proposition that you have to try and then go forward and sell. You know, with electric vehicles, you've described that exact same proposition, which I wouldn't disagree with, but still the risks are there. You know, electric vehicles are constantly communicating, constantly providing data, much of which is essential for the security features, essentially, of electric vehicles, but much of it isn't. And what's built in is the inability to switch off certain parts of data feeds that you would really not want going back um, to the country of source. And it's exactly the same risk methodology that you should be thinking of, which is if that data is being hoovered up out of the car, and pull back to country of origin, what are the policies that are in place for access of that technology? How does, sorry, the data, how does that data then get utilized and assimilated into understanding your country? It's yet another layer of granularity of, um, of, of intrusion upon a nation. And, and it becomes incredibly difficult because you now see this playing out, the economic side of it, yeah. in the EU, where you know, enormously ambitious uh, emissions targets and climate targets and realistically you're looking at it through that economic lens and you're almost well how else do they achieve it unless it's through electric vehicles or really if you'll indulge me um, I don't know if there's any and I, it, it, it pains me to call it but soccer fans out there it's really football <laughs> thank um, you thank you very much exactly thank you I knew you would agree um, if anyone was watching the European Championships recently and if you looked at the key sponsors mm. that were across there it was Chinese fintech firms and payment services, and it was Chinese electrical vehicles providers. Shrewd move, because you're accessing the right audience, which has an, a, a grouping of countries who have enormous policy pressure on them to deliver results. And I, you, know, you, you can see that, uh, I keep using the word convergence, but the convergence of pressure on the European Union, how on earth are they going to start factoring in the security risks of that at this moment? It feels like the horse is almost bolting in that regard. I just want to jump in with the EV conversation to sort of highlight when you're saying EV, I think you're also re referring to autonomous driving cars, right? Cool. And so this autonomous vehicle conversation, really, I have a colleague who was in China and was in one of these cars and made a video and showed it to me. Some of the capability was far beyond what, what we have. And I, I drive a Tesla 
I'm not afraid to admit. And so I use that to drive a time seat often. And it, it, the, the car is very capable. My car is very capable. It can drive me from my apartment to work in busy DC traffic with just me watching. But the things that I saw in the video were far beyond what we're doing. And you think about this from the uh, military perspective, autonomy is something that we're chasing. And we see in Ukraine the impact that these unmanned systems that are not fully autonomous are having on the battlefield there. And this is something that the military is paying attention to, is making the military rethink what these systems can actually do in terms of the, the modern battlefield. And so when we see autonomous driving vehicles in China doing things that we can't do here, just translate that into capability for the PLA. So I just wanted to add that security concerns or fears of Chinese domination of the EV market can be addressed in a number of different ways. One is to raise tariffs so high that they've just kept out, and you can go to Mexico and say, don't even make them there. And this is sort of this like counter strategy. The other, which I think is being more pursued in, in Europe and elsewhere, is to say, well, we have the tariffs, but come produce those vehicles, or let's license that technology to try to localize that expertise. You know, when China was behind in technology, they brought all these uh, foreign companies in, made them establish joint ventures, and did a whole lot of things to kind of you know, move quickly uh, and progress in the technology themselves. The question is for us here in the United States, is the solution to these problems just keep them out? Or is it you know, let them in but regulate them so to reduce the risks that you've described around autonomous vehicles or the, you know, data more generally? Um, and then what's the, our plan for moving ahead, right? Because I think that the strategy of just keeping them out isn't, I don't see where the success lies in that. Mm -hmm. I agree definitely on the, the bans are ineffective, too expensive to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, enforce. But I worry because of the military industrial fusion, when we bring in an industry partner, are we also bringing in the PLA? The, I, I worry mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Anyone with any smart ideas about how we move forward on this? So, so just, yeah. I, I, and I agree with Jessica, and, and it's yeah. a conundrum. I, I'm not sure it's as easy as just asking them to come and, and manufacture yeah. in our country, and that would, so contrary to what you would hear in political rallies, there are no two uh, giant uh, auto factories being built in Mexico. There are non-Chinese auto uh, factories being built in Mexico, period. Nevertheless, there is a debate in Mexico on whether we should uh, want them to come to our country and just, uh, Three days ago, uh, the Minister of Commerce of China issued guidelines to EV manufacturers in China not to export their technology to manufacturing uh, plants abroad, to keep it and just send the parts. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and that's China playing the counter game, so they, are, they know they have a, an advantage, not unlike the United States knowing they have an advantage on microchips. Uh, and that's something that is important for the world to understand that there are areas in which the Chinese now have advantages, just as the U.S. has advantages, and not assume that everything can be overcome just quickly with more money or with more Silicon Valley innovation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So look, this is a cyber summit. I would be remiss if I didn't ask at least one cyber-focused question. So the U.S. government has been increasingly vocal about warnings that China is a persistent threat to critical infrastructure, seeking to preposition on water, power, and telecom networks in the event of a conflict. How much progress have the US and Western allies made, and other allies, in bringing um, other Asian partners and allies on board in recognizing and calling out this threat? So I, I feel compelled to answer that because that was, again, a big part of my job was uh, working out how, how could you create more comfort with regional partners in the concept of calling out bad behavior. It's, it, it wasn't perceived to be um, a natural thing for our friends in Southeast Asia and Pacific Islands to be involved in uh, calling out their, their greatest trading partner in the North. So like Volt Typhoon, for instance? Well, I mean, Volt Typhoon, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a huge issue which has impacted the US. But I'm, talk, I'm going back a few years now when there are all sorts of incidents. You know, in Australia, we first called out um, Chinese activity in connection with uh, managed service providers, the cloud hopper incident, some people may remember that, goes back to 2018. Exactly, and we tried to get regional partners on board in attributing that activity, but there was a degree of, um, not suspicion, but concerns that their, their own intelligence holdings wouldn't be able to um, show the same kinds of activity. So what you've seen, and it was great having the Five Eyes partnership here, because what's shifted on that front you can now see the level of intelligence outreach 
um, cooperation and, dare I say, intelligence diplomacy that's now going on between agencies. So if you look at the recent APT40 attribution that took place in July this year, led by Australia, it was very much led by the Australian uh, Cybersecurity Centre, but it had Japan and South Korea, very importantly, on that list. And that does show a couple of things, one of which an increasing comfort in calling out what those countries are seeing on their own networks, but also, very importantly, the increased level of cooperation and coordination that's going on between agencies at that level across the region. So I would only expect now to see more and more regional partners get on board with these attributions because um, I may be telling no one anything in this room that's new, but the fact is in, in the region in which I live, the Chinese are rampant at going through networks and owning you know, government systems and, and commercial enterprises across the region. And when I say owned, it, you, know, you know what I mean, it's a cyber term. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's good to have that in your thinking. You know, why is that? It's, it's not that they want to be caught, it's that they really want to understand everything about the way that your country functions, your decision making and your future pathway in order that the advantage is ultimately held with China. Okay. So in the um, two minutes we have left, I'm going to do a lightning round, 30 seconds each. What is the one thing that policymakers and politicians get right about China that doesn't get enough attention? We've talked a lot about what they get wrong, but what do they get right, do you think, that actually doesn't really resonate or get enough attention? Tariffs and over uh, tariffs. Tariffs on Chinese uh, products is something the U.S. gets right. It's not on cyber, but it's just something that is right. At any level? At all levels. Okay. Toby? Oh my God, that's a, a, a tricky one. Can you go all to right. someone else first? I think of something clever enough so to say. I, I, I'll go back to a CSET report that we did a few years back, um, looking at um, you know Chinese students who come to the U.S. a lot in the tech protect area. There's been a conversation about you know banning students and limiting their access. But the the study that was done at CSET showed that 90% of these people either stay in the U.S. or in the West and want to be in the West. And I think the more we stay open to that that it, uh, attracting talent, the better we are. Okay. Jessica. Yeah, I'll, I'll footstop that and suggest that you know the Biden administration was very clear in Secretary Blinken's uh, speech a couple of years ago on China, uh, stating that we are lucky uh, when students and scholars uh, from China and elsewhere come to the United States to study and contribute their talents. Um, we can talk about how policy could be adjusted, especially uh, by Congress on immigration, to make them even more welcome rather than sending them back after they get their degrees here. Um, but that's an area where I think rhetorically um, and substantively there's, there's a, an appropriate emphasis uh, on running faster. Um, there is an There is. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. At the same time, not losing sight of the fact that there are exactly. a lot of... Uh, sure. Absolutely. Malign influence and threats that we have to pay attention to. Okay. So the, just the final thing I want to say is despite you know, everything I've said, one of the really important elements that needs to be in state-to-state -state relationships during times of tension is a conversation. Yeah. There's a direct conversation around these issues because the most dangerous part is that you lose that contact. Um, so for me, that's a component that needs to be remembered and, and reinforced despite everything that's going on. Very good point. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And, um, Thanks to this panel. Yeah.